George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st President of the United States, has been laid to rest. But his influence on U.S.-China relations is still being felt today. Hi, welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. President George Bush, the original, passed away in November at the age of 94. He's the first president I remember as a kid. In his years of service to the United States, he accomplished a tremendous amount. And as a final accomplishment, at his funeral, he got Trump and Obama to shake hands and sit practically next to each other. Hillary seems a little less than pleased. I think she wanted Trump's seat. The funeral was touching, especially the speech given by his son. No, the one people liked. I said, Dad, I love you and you've been a wonderful father. And the last words he would ever say on earth were, I love you too. To us, he was close to perfect, but not totally perfect. His short game was lousy. <laughs> wow, I think that's the first time I've ever seen people laughing with him. But George Bush Sr. was many things to many people. A patriot who fought for his country in World War II. The leader of the CIA at the end of the Cold War. A president in a time of transition. For others, he was a reptilian alien who secretly tried to have Reagan assassinated. So, you know, there's a lot of views on the guy. But since this is China Uncensored and not America Uncovered, I'll stick to the impact he had on U.S.-China relations, which was huge. So huge that on the sidelines of the recent G20 summit, Chinese leader Xi Jinping said he was greatly saddened by Bush's passing saying he was someone who made important contributions to the China-U.S. friendship and relationship during his lifetime. She apparently even asked Trump to convey a message of condolence. And let me just say, it was a great condolence. Trump has the best words. So, how did George H.W. Bush become China's old friend? Bush served as the second special envoy to China between 1974 and 75. He was basically an unofficial ambassador, since there was no official U.S.-China embassy at the time. According to CNN, he was known in Beijing as the Bicycle Riding Envoy. But after a year, Bush left the position to lead the CIA. And that's a whole nother story. But Bush saw Asia, and in particular China, as pivotal for the U.S. So when he became president, he carried on building the relationships he had in China. Here he is having a grand old time in Tiananmen Square in February 1989. Ah, Tiananmen Square, where absolutely nothing would go wrong four months later. Soldiers fired automatic weapons into crowds of civilians, and the casualties were staggering. The Chinese Red Cross says at least 2,600 people were killed. Oops. But before that happened, there were hopes Bush would stand up for human rights and political change in China. Two months earlier, at a banquet in China, Bush had invited two of China's most famous political dissidents, Fang Lijie and his wife, Li Xuxian. But then, the June 4th Tiananmen Square massacre happened, and it created a real pickle for President Bush. The Chinese Communist Party became an international pariah overnight. And on the surface, Bush took a hard stance. His administration put heavy economic sanctions on China. At a news conference, Bush said he was moved not only by Tank Man, but also by the often overlooked Tank Driver. Seeing the Tank Driver exercise restraint, I'm convinced that the forces of democracy are going to overcome these unfortunate events in Tiananmen Square. Unfortunately, that did not happen, and Bush played a role in it not happening. Because behind the scenes, Bush sent a secret delegation to assure the communist leadership that, don't worry, the relationship will be fine. Just a few weeks after the massacre, Bush sent National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft and Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence S. Eagleburger to China to keep open the lines of communication. I don't know what's more offensive, the complete disregard for the lives of those Chinese students or that there's a guy named Eagleburger. That's like being named White Rhino Sandwich. Anyway, according to this declassified U.S. State Department document, Bush told the leadership in Beijing that he wants to manage short-term events in a way that will best assure a healthy relationship over time. Basically, 
He sent the message to the Communist Party that no matter what a U.S. president says in public, behind the scenes, he'll be cooperative. And that was a tradition future presidents would follow. Ultimately, this caused a bit of a scandal when it was discovered. Bush defended his decision to the New York Times by saying, China is a billion plus people. They have a strategic position in the world that is important to us. I do not want to isolate the Chinese people. That was a policy that outlived Bush's presidency. That if the U.S. keeps engaging with China, things will get better. But better doesn't always mean better for everyone. As China expert James Mann asked, relationship with which China? Not with Chinese society as a whole, but with the party. And not even with the official Chinese Communist Party leadership of the time, headed by General Secretary Zhao Ziyang. Back then, the United States found countless ways to show sympathy for reform elements and dissidents in the Soviet Union, but not in China. China scholar Perry Link told Hong Kong's Apple Daily, this constituted not only a lie to the American people, but also the greatest failure of American policy toward China after the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests. Despite international sanctions, the relationship between the U.S. and Chinese governments thawed very quickly. By May 1990, the U.S. had renewed China's most favored nation trading status. In November 1991, Secretary of State James Baker visited China. Human rights were not big on the list of discussion topics. And then, in 1992, just three years after the bloody, bloody massacre, Chinese Premier Li Peng visited the United States and relations were basically restored. And in 1994, Bush met Jiang Zemin. Jiang was the next leader of China, and also, as it eventually turned out, Jiang was the next mass murderer of China. But that's another episode. Now, I don't want to give you the impression Bush's actions towards China were all bad. Bush was largely responsible for the Chinese Student Protection Act of 1992. It began as an executive order he signed in 1990, and essentially granted asylum for Chinese students in the United States after the Tiananmen Square massacre. In fact, the reason we have Shelley on our team is because her parents got that. But even after Bush's presidency ended in 1993, he was still pretty China-focused. Here he is in 2002, again with everyone's least favorite battle toad, Jiang Zemin. This was just three years after Jiang began the bloody purge against Falun Gong practitioners, a purge that's killed way more people than in Tiananmen Square. Then in 2008, Bush visited Beijing for the Olympics. He said China was an important friend and supporter of the U.S. That was after the party had just forcibly evicted one and a half million people for the games. But I mean, if we keep engaging with the Communist Party, sooner or later they'll have to get better. That was also the same year Bush released his China Diaries. In the foreword, he summed up his views of China. I love the Chinese people. One of my dreams for our world is that these two powerful giants will continue working toward a full partnership and friendship that will bring peace and prosperity to people everywhere. That's a nice sentiment. It's just too bad that, like many U.S. politicians, Bush confused supporting the Chinese people with supporting the Chinese Communist Party. So, what do you think about the China legacy left behind by George H.W. Bush? Leave your comments below. And before we wrap up, now is the time when I answer a question from a fan who supports China Uncensored on the crowdfunding website Patreon. Joachim Eidland asks, are there other Chinese politicians that have been connected to other cartoon characters other than Winnie the Pooh, a.k.a. Xi Jinping? Ah, yes. For those of you not in the know, Chinese leader Xi Jinping has been compared to Winnie the Pooh. And after this meeting with President Obama, Chinese netizens began to notice some more striking similarities. And when Xi Jinping became president for life, it happened again. It became so much of a meme, Winnie the Pooh has occasionally been banned in China. As for other Chinese officials, while this is not a cartoon character, Jiang Zemin in general looks like a toad. And that led to this giant inflatable toad being censored. Which is ridiculous. The giant inflatable toad is much better looking. Here at China Uncensored, we've noticed a few more Chinese officials who look like cartoons. Like the perpetually sad Vice President Wang Qishang, who looks like Eeyore. 
and Joe Yang Kong, who is a human version of a thwomp from Super Mario Bros. Chinese authorities are fully aware of all the ways people make fun of them, and they're extremely sensitive. And that's why you probably won't be seeing Winnie the Pooh at the Shanghai Disneyland. Oh, bother. Thanks for your question. And if you'd like to support China Uncensored and get a shot at having your questions answered, consider supporting the show with a dollar or more per episode on the crowdfunding website Patreon. Link is below or on the end screen. Thanks for watching this episode of China Uncensored. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Chappell. See you next time.